Hello, everyone. Um, we will be, we'll have the other panelists uh, join us in just a few seconds here. Hope you've been enjoying the meeting uh, today um, and appreciate everyone's patience with uh, the electronic and technological difficulties and challenges. Uh, but I think overall, um, our uh, scientific our, content uh, has not been uh, harmed by any of that. So, um, okay. okay, we've got a few people on board. I think we're waiting for Dr. Spiegel. There she is. Great. Okay, so I think some of you have another window open. Um, if you could mute that other window, that would be great. It'll get rid of the echo. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Um, so I have a little case that's a, a live case, uh, you know, like a real, real patient. <laughs> And just thought we'd go over it and kind of discuss some of the themes that we have uh, talked about today. So this is a 44-year-old uh, uh, female who initially presented with a um, after a motor vehicle collision and was found to have a, uh, a mass in her left femur, and about. She went home after uh, the stabilization in the ED, and then about two weeks later, she tripped over her vacuum cleaner and presented with, again, severe left lower extremity pain, um, and she was in traction until a bed was available at the tertiary care center. So this is a picture of her femur x-ray. You can see this expansile lesion in the distal femur um, with a fracture, and clearly this is not just a motor vehicle collision, vacuum cleaner, fracture. There's something else going on here. Um, so she went, uh, oh, I should go back. So she went to surgery um, with the orthopedic surgeon and um, this was her pathology on, uh, on the um, uh, bone uh, biopsy. So, Wondering if anybody wanted to make comment on what we see here. Dr. Sieblick? Well, I know the patient, so I'm cheating. Well, that's okay, but just describe <laughs> what we see. <laughs> um, I see orphan Annie clear nuclei. Um, and so my first thought is this is um, some form of papillary thyroid cancer. Right. And, uh, and we can see the, the follicles, it's, it's so beautiful with papillae. Dr. Lubin's not here anymore, but I'm sure he could describe this a lot more. The, but this is clearly something uh, that is in papillary prawns and things like that. And then if we do the thyroglobulin stain, it lights up really, the TTF stain, it lights up really, really well. So this was indeed uh, papillary thyroid cancer that was in the um, femur. And uh, unfortunately, during the femur surgery, the patient initially desaturated um, during induction. Uh, there was a discussion between the orthopedic surgeon and the anesthesia team, and the decision was made to proceed with the surgery. Then intra-op, she had another really bad desaturation uh, resulting in cardiac arrest. Um, they were able to resume uh, spontaneous circulation, and she was treated with TPA for a presumed uh, uh, pulmonary embolus. And indeed, she did have a massive pulmonary embolus. She did have a DVT in her left lower extremity, and part of this imaging revealed this PA embolism. So, so I'm going to pause there and see what we should do. Um, we have a, a, a woman with uh, metastatic bony papillary thyroid cancer with her native thyroid still in place. Um, and I think the next slide, oh, here's some uh, pertinent labs. She was COVID negative, TSH is normal. Her TG was elevated at 1311 um, and her TG antibodies were negative. Uh, we did get a CT of the neck and that demonstrates this massive um, right thyroid mask. Really not much cervical lymphadenopathy at all. 
uh, which is good for her. But um, so again, to recap, 44 years old, healthy, um, metastatic uh, papillary thyroid cancer to the femur and also to other bony areas in her sacrum and in her hip um, with a mass in her thyroid gland. Uh, to start off with, would anyone want to or think that the thyroid needed to be biopsied? So I'll, I'll chime in. I think, you know, we generally do do a biopsy to confirm um, the diagnosis. And then I'd also, this is behaving unusually. Papillary thyroid cancers with next to bones uh, is very uncommon. Um, and um, so more tissue is definitely going to be of interest. Um, I would think, you know, I'd be worried about anaplastic de-differentiation, except that what you sh showed there <laughs> is not looking at a plastic like at all. Um, but I think doing a biopsy to confirm is, is very real. And then the other thing is, is if that specimen was decalcified, um, then it's, it's not gonna be good for genotyping. And, um, and I really wanna know, you know what the genotype of this cancer is. Um, in, um, in a 44 year old woman uh, with a PTC, this could be a fusion driven cancer. The, the fusions, RET and TREC, and alfusions are seen in the younger patient population. Um, so um, that's a distinct possibility. Um, so I, in doing a biopsy, I would ask my um, people doing it to make sure that they get a couple of cores. So, um, so would anyone recommend going straight to surgery to do the thyroidectomy? Because we want Dr. Halkar involved as well uh, to give the radioactive iodine, or maybe not. What, should we not be doing surgery? Should we be waiting for the testing to be done from Dr. Wirth's uh, a recommendation before we move forward with surgery on her thyroid? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'd like to debote her as much as possible. Uh, I'd like to Alleate her symptoms, you know, certainly surgery is on the table, but also probably radiation to the, uh, to the femur. Um, I think it depends on how critical she is as far as her hemodynamic status, as far as her surgical risk. But, you know, we have to ba balance that against, uh, you know, the risk of the, uh, of the actual thyroidectomy in her. Um, but I, in, 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 in it, that apart, I think I would like to do both as much as possible before asking Dr. Halkar to to um, to aim his uh, beams or probably not his beams but his you know yeah. radiation radio it area. has appeared uh, unusually in the sense you know well, if it is really papillary it has gone to the bones more than the lymph nodes but you know that again shows the heterogeneity of the tumor uh, so, but the first step would be to do, uh, and before her, uh, these accidents, her general health was good, I suppose, and all her cardiac arrest and everything was due to a massive PE. Am I right? Correct. Because she had no comorbidities before her uh, accident. Um, she was, she was obese and she had some poly, poly substance abuse, uh, disorder, uh, use disorder. Um, but really nothing. Um, the, it looked like to be an endolus originating from that fracture site. Um, so that's what, is there any role for liquid biopsy in this patient, Dr. Subia? Yeah, so the thing is, you know, the, uh, now, now that you mentioned liquid biopsy, we should, I don't think so it was mentioned that we need to get the tumor markers. I think to get the tumor markers, I have globulin and see uh, to, see, you know, to get a baseline uh, even before surgery of these tumor markers. So again, liquid biopsy, if, if the tumor is there, I think we can do the MBS testing right away. And you know, if the tumor, uh, if you don't have that, then you can do a liquid biopsy to essentially uh, to get the, you know, the, the fusion or any of the alterations that you see in the tumor. So there was a serum thyroglobulin done pre-op that was a little elevated, 1311. So, um, 
So it sounds like- Dr. Chen, I guess I would, you know, I, I wonder how receptible um, the disease is. Um, we just see, you know, two images here, the CT scan, um, but, you know, I worry about a, a nice plane there between the trachea and the tumor and the esophagus. I, you know, I'd want to know what her, the status of her vocal cord function is as well. Um, and then I, you know, want to know about the other, the contralateral side. Is there any disease there and are we going to be worried about bilateral uh, uh, vocal cords being threatened? So preoperatively, her uh, vocal cord function was uh, normal bilaterally, uh, and um, uh, the imaging that was done um, did not show any other nodules on the left side. Uh, there was just this large uh, thyroid mass. The, the margin against the trachea was a little bit uh, obscured, but everything else had nice, clean borders. So there was really uh, little indication preoperatively that there was a lot of stickiness to it. Um, so one of the things that we did do was to discuss with her, you know, whether we do surgery or not and what type of surgery, do we only uh, do a hemi on her, do we do a total, and what to do if surgery wasn't doable at all because of her recent um, massive PE with cardiopulmonary arrest. And by the time we were consulted on her, it had been about four weeks after her femur surgery. Uh, so we did get um, medicine and everyone to buy in to see what her risk was. They felt like her risk was acceptable for surgery. Uh, so we did uh, go ahead with surgery. And Dr. Sieblick actually can comment on what she found intraoperatively since she was the surgeon on this case. So th thank you, Dr. Chen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Yes. Um, so she was, She first of all, she was very stable going off to sleep with excellent vital signs throughout. Um, she oxygenated well, and this was um, after uh, bridging of her anticoagulation. The uh, pre-incision ultrasound confirmed that she had a very uh, multi-nodular appearance of the right side, which uh, the superior pole extended fairly superiorly. Uh, the left side was also enlarged uh, with a multinodular appearance. There were no um, suspicious lateral nodes, um, and, and indeed that was confirmed at surgery. She had no adhesion of her strap muscles or adjacent structures. Um, she did, uh, the tumor did come off the trachea, but there was, a um, shaved a, um, a tracheal biopsy, and that was negative for tumor. And so there wasn't any gross evidence of extra thyroidal extension, and there were, was no gross evidence of lateral disease or nodes within level six of the central neck. And her final pathology did come back as papillary as well. Um, so is it time for RAI now, or do we skip RAI and go straight to TKI? You know, I, I, I'll take that one, I guess. I'm, I'm a little, uh, you know, maybe on the, on the other side of the pendulum that uh, Dr. Alburn showed. I'd like to know her genomic, uh, uh, you know, profile. I'd like to know what is this cancer? Is it, you know, uh, targetable? Is it mutation or, uh, you know, fusion-driven cancer? I think I, I would take that into consideration, uh, even though I agree that RAI is the current standard. That would be my answer. But I, I, I would like to know what her cancer is. So now Whether we have the thyroidectomy specimen. We can send that off. Um, but it will be yeah. a few weeks until we get that back. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, is there anything about those about those results that would uh, obviate your the need but, for RAI? Yeah, I mean, I think the question is: Is there like an anaplastin component? Uh, is there, for example, if BRAF uh, alteration in the setting of an anaplastin component? I think in that scenario, I would be um, more encouraged or more, I mean, leaning towards an early start of. Uh, of a targeted therapy uh, if you're dealing with an anaplastic uh, situation here. That would be one scenario. 
I don't know. I would have loved to ask our pathologist whether in a size of this tumor, how many sections will we take? And I don't see ATA also doesn't have a very good guideline that how many sections are done in a six centimeter tumor, for example. Are they only half it or is they do it every uh, five millimeters or what do they do? Because that's one thing we, I always felt when, when I see a classical papillary not behaving well after five years. And I always wondered whether the pathologist did not slice the specimen enough and did not find an area of a bad player in that specimen. But unfortunately, none of the professional guidelines do exactly mention the requirement of how thick the slices should be when you, when you have a larger tumor. At Emory, I think they do it at around every two millimeters or something like that. That's what I've heard from Emory. But I don't see a definite guideline for pathologists how to handle a large specimen of thyroid tumor. So it was uh, BRAS B600 negative on IHC. Um, that's the only information we have right now because we're waiting for the other uh, more comprehensive testing. Is that is that in information useful for you guys? That you know that information is useful, but you know the thing is that we still don't know if it has any component of uh, anaplasia. Then. Right, so I think we need a comprehensive NGS panel in this in, you know, in this patient because you know even if the pathology does not detect that, you know sometimes the molecular profile can can give us an idea. If you have P2P3 cut alteration, it's more likely that it's an ATG component in this unusual aggressive case that is metastatic to the bones in an unusual site than just a de novo pa you know de novo papillary you know thyroid cancer. And you know, again, our post surgery, of course, uh, using the convalescent saying that it's going to take at least four to six weeks. Uh, maybe after, at least after four weeks, I think we should draw another uh, tumor marker uh, to see if there is appropriate reduction of the tumor markers for surgery. And in the meanwhile, hopefully, we can get the you know uh, the PG or you know the safety results back in India testing testing back. There was a question about how quickly the turnaround time is for the liquid biopsy. I think it's probably. Uh, it, depends. It, it, it depends. You know, if it's in house testing, it can, we can have a rapid turnaround as much as, as early as like uh, four to five days. Um, that can be quick. But the thing is that with the liquid biopsy, it's specific, but it may not be sensitive. We need tumors with, that are shedding. And, you know, that with the higher tumor mutation of, you know, tumor, tumor burden for the liquid biopsy to show up. You know, again, we have novel uh, liquid biopsy technology that can detect even with lower, uh, you know, mutations. But you know, patient, I don't know if this patient would be shedding a lot of, um, uh, you know, the of DNA to detect liquid biopsy. Deepak, so, what's the what's the panel you use for liquid biopsy? I mean, you know, is there a specific panel for thyroid, or do you use your regular like? Um, you know, long. Okay. We have an in house India Anderson panel that's similar to the. Yeah, panel. we have that too. That, that's that. a panel yeah. that, that's what we use, that's an in house panel. And there used to be when Dr. Corey was here, he used to have a panel just for thyroid for red testing, but I think now with the class uh, testing, central testing, we use the uh, in house testing for thyroid cancer. Yeah. And the thing is that if it's there, it's there. If it's not there, but we still need the tissue, you know, here tissue. Uh, made in India would be you know, more sensitive and specific in this case. So what what should we, I mean, let's say, let's reverse and let's say that she cannot have a total thyroidectomy done because she was medically unstable from the PE. Um, what, do we just wait until she stabilizes before we do surgery? Or Dr. Halkar, would you try to treat her? Or should we start with systemic therapy right away? What happens if we cannot do surgery? Yeah. Okay. If we cannot do surgery, um, technically, I would not uh, give radioactive iodine. Uh, I would, um, uh, you know, I'm sure she had surgery, right? I have a question for Dr. Stiblitz. Was there any lymph node um, samples? Any lymph nodes were sampled during her surgery? 
I thank you for, for asking. I inspected her central neck and there were no um, uh, enlarged lymph nodes to sample. So I typically, um, uh, to reduce uh, injury to the parathyroids and the um, recurrent nerve, I usually don't strip out the fat if there's no grossly enlarged lymph nodes. I'm pretty, pretty thorough on that. So no, um, uh, on purpose. Uh, one thing I can tell is, uh, you know, Naturally, none of us have seen large number of uh, anaplastic cancers, but the anaplastic cancers that I've seen mostly tend to be lo very locally, very invasive mm -hmm. uh, for the size of this tumor. Uh, and bone mets are less likely, mostly the mediastinal mets and the lung mets are mostly the uh, anaplastic cancer have metastasized. But again, being anaplastic, it can be anything, but uh, this doesn't look like uh, that is much of an anaplastic mm -hmm. disease. Do you have an idea how long her thyroid nodule was there? No. Or she was not about, not at all aware of her thyroid nodule. I don't think she even knew she had a thyroid mass. Okay. Yeah. She has presented like what I used to see cases in India probably. She presented with a femur yeah. fracture, pain in her femur leg. Fracture, yes. That's the way she presented. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, we I, have about so I would do I an I one three one whole body scan yeah. for two reasons. Um, whatever the when you are waiting for all the uh, genomics, I would do an I one three one whole body scan first and see whether there are any more uh, lesions. And with whole body scan, I can use this. We can do spec CT, so we can get an idea: is there any cervical vertebral lytic lesion or any other area lytic lesions that can be much more dangerous than her. Uh, lesion in the femur, which I'm sure has been fixed by the orthopedic mm -hmm. guys. Yes. And if those lesions show in very intense uptake, I would, the first step would be to give radioactive iodine and always keeping in mind the radioactive iodine may not do all that good for her. Um, and then w by the time we would have our uh, gene analysis done. And if there are targetable things, then we can, we can do the targetable things. May I put a vote in for a brain MRI to rule out brain meds before the radioactive iodine? I, I agree completely that it's worth finding out if she has iodine avid disease. Um, but you know, I think that um, we haven't, um, uh, brain meds are under recognized right. um, in patients. And with this unusual pattern of metastatic disease, um, I wouldn't, be too too surprised if if there was a tiny little brain met there that you'd want to know about yeah thank you for uh stating that because we did do an mri of her brain uh because it was so unusual um and it was negative but let's say that there are brain mets um what happens if you were to give radioactive iodine and someone had brain mets dr Helkar? uh we have given uh you know uh, with radioactive iodine with brain mets uh, if I know a priori, we would have always given, usually, and we never give radioactive iodine without doing an I-131 whole body scan. So uh, we don't blindly give uh, I-131. So we, the whole body scan would have showed us the brain mat with concentrating iodine. And at that time, we'll give them a steroid shower. And with steroid shower, we have treated, it's not, un, not very common, maybe less than 1% or much less than that. We, we will see, maybe I, I've seen about four or five brain mets in the last 25, 30 years here at Emory. So, uh, and most of them we have treated with radioactive iodine and it has not caused any problem. Okay. Well, I think that, that uh, we have about one minute left. So that I think wraps up our uh, day today. Um, let me just check the, oh, uh, there's a question about radi external beam radiation. Um, to the uh, femur. Um, sometimes we do uh, external beam radiation if there's uh, worrisome signs about the spinal cord um, with compression to the spinal cord, but we don't yes. routinely do yes. it. If there is a car, Go yeah, ahead. not for a fracture, the orthopedic should fix it first. Right. So there is no role for external beam for a, already a fracture there. Yeah. Uh, if it was in um, a small lytic lesion, then I could have given external beam. When we have these experts, I would like to ask one quick question before we wrap it up. On one of the things that we didn't uh, address is radiation-induced uh, thyroid cancer. 
uh, are there any more, they run a little bit more aggressive code than the de novo thyroid cancer. Is there anything more about genetics about radiation-induced thyroid cancer or that can lead to some different management? I think that that's a very timely question, and I think the answer is yes. So the radiation-induced thyroid cancers um, have a much higher rate of, of fusions present in them, gut fusions and NTREC fusions. And so, you know, we, we actually see these cancers so rarely, um, but they are more likely to harbor rut fusions. The, in the, one of the Chernobyl papers, just as an example, the um, oncogenic driver fusion rate was 58%. Um, so um, that's, I guess, a um, uh, good sign of the coin of those radiation-induced thyroid cancers. Well, thank you everyone for participating and thank you especially to our speakers, uh, Dr. Worth, Dr. Sabia, you know, we're really thrilled. We wish you could be here in person in Atlanta. It's a beautiful day today, uh, but we're so glad that you were able to uh, share your expertise with all of us. Um, Dr. Saba, Dr. Halakar, Dr. Sieblick, thank you for hanging on to our last session today. And um, hopefully everyone will enjoy the rest of your weekend. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you so much. Take care.